I'm Leah Wan and I'm happy to welcome you to worship today. Here's a couple of things I want to share. Please let us know you're here worshiping with us today. It helps us know who we're connecting with and who we may have lost touch with. So please pull out your phone and send a message to 281-305-1069. That's 281-305-1069. If this is your first time worshiping with us, type the word welcome. It gives us a chance to get in touch and ask how we can help you feel welcome. After you send that message, you'll receive a follow-up link to click and fill out your connection card with us today. Thanks for letting us know that you're here. Next Sunday is going to be our back to school bash and homecoming service at Asbury. If you haven't been back in a long time, this is the sign you've been waiting for, that it's time. Invite every student you know to worship with us next week, and we'll offer blessings in person for each student here and give them a start of school gift with snow cones and fun. We're all looking forward to starting this year off right, so bring your kids and grandkids and invite your neighbors. We'll see you then. Asbury will be hosting a blood drive on August 29th between 10.30 a.m. and 3 p.m. in Cornerstone. If you can, sign up and feel free to invite friends from the community to give this gift of life. There are two new Bible studies starting soon. Linda Wheat's Tuesday Afternoon Bible Study Group is starting a new study this week called Life from the Upside, Seeing God at Work in the World. Linda's group meets on Zoom each Tuesday starting at 4 p.m. David Haas will also be starting a new Bible study group this Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. They will be meeting across the street from the church at the Fordham starting at 2 p.m. Please call the church office if you would like more information. Thank you for worshiping with us today. If you're worshiping with us on Facebook, say hello in the comments and let us know you're here. Welcome to Worship with us. Well, good morning, and welcome to Worship with Asbury today. I'm Lindsay, the pastor here, and whether you're in the sanctuary with us or joining us from home, we want to say a big welcome to worship today. Now, this is an old thing that folks used to do, but I want to see if you uh, might know it or have heard it before. God is good? All the time. All the time? God is good. And you know what? Worship reminds us of that every single week, no matter what your week has looked like or your week ahead is going to bring, God is good all the time and all the time God is good and worship reminds us of that. And so I'm so glad to be in worship with you today. Welcome. Well, good morning. We are just excited to be able to join our voices together this morning as we worship together. If you're here in the sanctuary, we invite you to stand if you are willing and able. And if you're at home following along, the words will be on the screen. Let's join together in worship this morning.
at this time. We're going to welcome forward Jalen and the children. So usually Ms. Paula is up here with all of you, but she has a family weekend this weekend, so uh, we hope she has a great time and look forward to seeing her back. So instead, it's me. And I want to show you uh, something, a few pictures from one of my favorite things. I love to take family vacations. And I wonder, do y'all like to take family vacations? We have a good time, we make nice memories, but the thing is, as nice as this is to have a family vacation, they're big and infrequent, and that's not when we really learn about each other. When we really learn about each other is all the time we spend together doing our ordinary, everyday things, like running errands, sharing meals, and driving in the car a lot. Yes, you may. And so let me have Asher, can you join me up here? And I need one volunteer from the audience. Ms. Joyce, do you want to join us? So let me ask you, Asher, what is one of your dad's favorite things? Orange. Orange, the color of the food? The color. And what is Ms. Joyce's favorite color? I don't know. See, thank you, thank you. The point is, you don't know because they don't spend time together. It's the time together that really allows you to get to know someone. And that's what our scripture is about today. I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, a slightly different translation than Pastor Lindsay will be using in just a little bit. Jesus went to the area of Caesar Philippi. He said to his followers, the disciples, I am the son of man. Who do the people say I am? The disciples answered, some people say you are John the Baptist, others say you are Elijah, and others say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked his disciples, and who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. No person taught you that. My father in heaven showed you who I am. So I tell you, you are Peter the rock, and I will build my church on that rock. The power of death will not be able to defeat my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The things you don't allow on earth will be the things that God does not allow. The things you do allow on earth will be the things that God does allow. Then Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Now, what's really funny is the last time I was up here doing the children's sermon with you, the scripture that day asked almost the exact same question. Who is Jesus? Except that time it was being asked to Jesus, and this time it's being asked by Jesus. And the, uh, the thing is, he was asking it of his disciples. And boy, did they spend a lot of time together. They were traveling together, walking for hours and hours and hours, and they were sharing meals together, and they were in close accommodations together, and they were running errands together, all the same way that we spend time with our family members. And just like our family members, that's how they got to know each other. Not so much with the big, big events, but all that time every day. But here's the thing about all that time. Even though you get to know things like favorite colors and favorite foods, what you really get to know about someone is their character. So in my family, I may know that uh, Sylvia likes her chicken diced instead of shredded, but what I know about her heart is that compassion and justice are extremely important to her. And I may know for my son, Alan, that he prefers 
zipper lunch boxes to Velcro lunch boxes, but what I know about his heart is that he will always have a job that allows him to nurture a person or a thing. And that is why the same reason that Simon Peter in this verse knew for certain who Jesus was. All that time they spent together, let him know who, what Jesus' character was. And so just as last time, the answer to how do we spend time with Jesus is the same answer as today. We use the discipleship pathway. And the discipleship pathway, let's see if we can say it together. It is to worship Christ, grow in Christ, serve Christ, and share Christ. And that is how we can be as certain as Peter to know who Jesus is. Will you all join me in prayer? Dear God, we thank you so much for your son Jesus. We thank you that we are able to know him and to love him. And we want to be able to say with the certainty as the kid who's in class, wiggling in their seat, waving their arm around, going, I know, I know, we want to be that person when it comes to naming Jesus as your son. But we often find so many other ways to spend our time rather than with you and with Jesus. So we ask for your help to spend our time knowing you. And we thank you that you and Jesus want to know as much about us as we want to know about you. Amen. Our kids can go on to Well Worship if they like. It's a children's church, and um, you can grab them at the close of the service. And if they want to stay in the sanctuary, that's great too. Um, a few prayer requests that I'd like for you to be keeping in your uh, prayers this week in your own devotional time. Uh, Benny and Trudy Harvey lost their son this week. Um, he's from Laporte. His service will be at 10 o'clock on Thursday. Um, so please be keeping them in your prayers. Um, Many of you might have heard, um, but Mike Sweeney passed away last night. And so um, please be keeping Pam in your prayers and their whole family. Um, Mike was, uh, you know, kind of a part of the heart of this place and had served in pretty much every possible way. And we're really going to miss him a lot. Um, so be keeping them in your prayers. Don Elliott had a heart procedure this week. It went well. Prayers for her recovery. And uh, Carolyn Baldwin as well. Let's go ahead and go to our Lord. Um, in prayer this morning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we admit that a lot of times um, we try to uh, come up with our own ideas uh, for how to feel more at peace, to be able to catch our breath. Sometimes we turn to things that aren't all that helpful. Sometimes we just kind of sink into it a little bit and wallow. Today we remember that there is no balm for our souls like you. And our hope is that we uh, make it our practice to go to you first and not second or third or fourth. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for loving us unconditionally, not because of what we have done, um, but just because we're your kid and you love us no matter what. We pray, Lord, that we would live out of the, the peace and the wholeness that that knowledge brings us. We lift up uh, the folks that we just mentioned to you and other folks who uh, were unmentioned this morning but are on our hearts. Lord, bring them comfort and healing and hope. Help them to have a real experience of your presence and your peace that surpasses all understanding. God, we thank you that you are the one who is over it all, that you have provision over our lives, that we can really trust you, um, that even when the circumstances are shifting beneath our feet, we know that you have the ultimate victory, that you are working for our good and, and for the good of the kingdom of God. And so help us to be people who walk every day with the confidence and the joy of that. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We thank you for washing us clean. And we pray that we would be people uh, who other folks meet Christ through us. Bless these gifts that are about to be given. Use them according to your purpose only, Lord. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just this last Friday, we had yet another one of our parents' night outs. It was a great opportunity for kids um, in our church and in our community to get to know about God's love for them. Every time that you give a gift, you're contributing to ministries like that. So here in our sanctuary, there's offering plates by the exits. At home, you can just place a check in the mail. You can give through our website or your own bank online or through text message. I want to say thank you to all who are part of the ministries of Asbury.
Amen, amen. Thank you. Y'all be seated. Katerina Mann is one of our students who grew up in this church and is going to be going off to college here in about a week. She asked a few weeks ago whether she could share part of her testimony with us uh, before she went up to school. And she wanted to talk a little bit about what God has been doing in her life and also, um, you know, the role that this church has played in it. So I want to y'all to help me welcome Katerina forward this morning. Hello, friends. <laughs> Good morning. As Lindsay said before, I asked her a couple weeks if I could give my testimony because this church has given me so much in my life. I wanted to give something back, and I don't think anything material-wise could match up to that. So here I stand in front of you. <laughs> Lindsay asked me where I wanted to start when I was giving my testimony, and I looked at her and I said, I have no idea. <laughs> so I thought about it, and I think the best place to start is the beginning. So I was born on May 7th, 2003, <laughs> at 11.41 a.m. Thank you, Mom, for telling me that. Uh, my sisters gave me my name, Katerina, but I prefer to go by Kat because that's what all my friends call me. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I first came to this church, I was three? Three, yes, thank you. Okay, there's confirmation. I was three years old, and I did not know a single person, except for my mother, who worked in the front office. And that was frightening for me, to come here not knowing anyone. But obviously I made some friends, and I stayed. A few things have changed in the 15 years that I've been here. Um, I don't think I'm this tall anymore. I think I grew an inch or two, I would say. Um, there are some faces I don't see here any morning, anymore in the mornings, but I see a lot of new ones. Here are some people I'd like to mention that have changed my life dramatically. Uh, first up are Diane Peppo and Alana Moser. Thank you so much for standing up for me for my accommodations with my dyslexia. I don't think I would be where I am academically without them. Uh, Chance Moser, who was the big brother to me for as long as I can remember. Thank you, you goofball, for teasing me all those years. Barbara McFalling, for being the sweetest lady to me in the mornings and always reminding me to laugh every day. Julian John Harrison, for teaching me how to properly read the Bible. <laughs> Dixie McAdams, for teaching me how to prepare communion and serve the Lord. And Sue and Bob Freeman, for treating me as if I was their own grandchild. I wanted to share a verse with y'all that have gotten me through a lot of hard times in my life. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. He said to me, my grace is enough for you because power is made in weakness. So I gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I am all right with weaknesses, insults, disasters, harassments, and stressful situations. For the sake of Christ, because when I am weak, then I am strong. I have no idea what Paul was talking about when you say that you're strong in your weaknesses because I can't even do a push-up, so I don't know how that's a strength, so. Okay. But when I look at this verse, I can hear my mom's voice in my head. Katarina, that's how I know when I'm in trouble. How are you so calm? Does nothing bother you? Well, Mother, I can assure you, I am bothered. Because in my mind, there is a hurricane raging, and, but I try not to show it so it doesn't scare anybody. <laughs> in all honesty, I bottle up everything. 
I put up my walls in a blink of a lie so none of you can see it. I keep saying I'm okay, and I am okay, until I believe it, and then I realize that I am not. I think that's why this verse speaks out to me. It reminds me that you can be strong in your weakest point in your life. You never fully hit rock bottom, ever. Taking communion here taught me to thank the Lord for everything he has given me. For y'all, the congregation, I don't think I'd be where I am now. For my parents, for my sisters, for my friends. Thank you. I thank the Lord for y'all every day. But then also when I pray, I thank him for that as well. But then I also say, do you know how hard it is down here? It is hard. <laughs> at times I feel like I need different air to breathe because I can't seem to get enough at times. And I would ask him this over and over again, saying, how can I breathe again? Because I'm forgetting how. And all of a sudden, because it's how God works, I hear the words five minutes. And of course, when I hear five minutes, I don't know what that meant at the time. So I thought about it. And then I put my phone on a timer for five minutes, and I kind of just sat there. And then I realized what it was for. It was a five-minute breather. I literally had to take five in order to reset myself. And in that five minutes, I, I would pray, and I would think about it. I may have screamed a time or two. <laughs> Those five minutes were my saving grace. Asbury has given me so much. Y'all have given me a place where instead of I am just wandering aimlessly through life, I can come here and spiritually reset myself and align myself with God once again. Because out there, it is hard to keep a good faith. I know y'all know that. It is hard, but then I come here every Sunday, and I am reminded why I stay. Y'all have accepted me and my family and my friends and anyone who else has walked through that door, no matter what they look like, what they believe, how they think, or who they are. Asbury has given me that. I am so grateful for that mindset that y'all have given me. Y'all are a home away from home, and I am sad to leave. So thank you for being my church home. You're going to hear two messages today. <laughs> and actually, the way that you hear Katarina talk about God uh, is actually just a, a real-life um, example of exactly what we're talking about today. Thank you, Kat. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for this day. Uh, we thank you for worship that gives us a reset. We also thank you uh, that we expect you to show up for us in worship, in music, in conversation with one another, and in scripture. So give us your eyes to see and your ears to hear whatever you have for us today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, there are some tests that you take in life that are multiple choice, which is great because that means you have a 25% chance of getting it right no matter what you do, and I'm the kind of person who likes to get things right. So here's a multiple choice question for you. In the state of Georgia, it is illegal to eat which of these foods with a fork? A, ice cream, B, a peach, C, fried chicken, or D, none. What do you think? You got a 25% chance here, right? All right, drum roll, please. 
please? The correct answer is C, fried chicken. <laughs> Can you believe that? Fill in the blank tests, on the other hand, are a whole lot harder than multiple choice because instead of just four possibilities, there's an infinite number of ways to answer the question. And it's possible that instead of a 25% chance of getting it right, you've got like one chance out of infinity to get it right. So here's a fill in the blank question for you. Why did George ever think it was necessary to create a law about forks and fried chicken in the first place? Yeah, I couldn't come up with an answer either. Uh, it is a mar much harder question whenever it's open-ended. It's a much harder test. And whatever the context, the way that we answer questions actually says quite a lot about us. Maybe that's why Jesus asked so many of them. It's actually a trademark of Jesus as a spiritual leader. Most spiritual leaders give answers. Moses gave a whole lot of answers. That's what all of the law in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy is. Muhammad was a man who provided a whole lot of answers about how life should be lived for the people who practice Islam. Jesus, Jesus didn't actually give a whole lot of answers. A few people have gone through and done tallies, and they say that best, you know, I mean, there's probably a little wiggle room here, but during the course of his ministry, Jesus gave around 110 one, that's a ballpark figure. Jesus answered about 110 questions that are recorded in the Bible. That's how many answers he gave. Now, instead of being the one answering questions, do you know how many questions he asked? Can you take a guess? About 307. Recorded in the Bible, Jesus asked almost three times as many questions as he answered. And get this, this is even funnier to me. Out of the about of 110 questions that he answered, do you want to know who asked 52 of them? Jesus did. <laughs> Almost half the questions that he answered were asked by Jesus himself. This guy loves questions. And many of the times that he answers questions, he answers them in the form of parables, which by design, I mean, have you read those? They're kind of confusing sometimes. And for sure, by design, on purpose, they are supposed to raise more questions than they answer. The few times he actually gives an answer, he answers in a way that causes us to ask more questions. And instead of us getting frustrated by that, maybe there's divine purpose there. Something Jesus wants us to notice. Maybe it's really important to Jesus to get us asking questions. When we dig into the Gospels, we find that Jesus was like the world's expert questioner. And that's interesting because I think we usually come to Jesus for answers. Which is a good thing to do, don't get me wrong. I mean, you, we should be asking Jesus what he thinks and what is on his mind and what we should do. But I think that in an effort to focus on Jesus' answers, we've downplayed how important questions are and why. What is the value of questions? Let me answer that by asking you a question. How many questions do you think the average adult asks in a day? Shout out some guesses. 5, 30, 20. Okay. Okay. It's about 20. Y'all are pretty close, okay? The average adult asks about 20 questions a day. Okay, now, next question. How many questions does the average four-year-old ask in a day? <laughs> to their best guesses, it's about 300, okay? Which any parent with a four-year-old can attest to. Mama, why are there wrinkles on your hand? Papa, what kind of animals toot? Mommy, why does this dirt taste so gross? Daddy, I know I'm four, but why can't I drive? Right? Like now, why do younger kids ask more questions than adults do? Because they are learning. They're learning like crazy. The more questions you ask, the more that you learn. There is a not so subtle hint there, friends. Jesus is saying, keep up the questions. You remember that time he said something like, if you don't become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of God? Be curious about God. 
Be curious about the world as God created it. Be curious about your spirit and your faith. Ask a lot of questions. One of the things I love about the Methodist Church is that we value asking questions. Not everybody has to come to the same answer, but let's ask the questions together. And when we talk about living the life of a disciple consisting of worshiping Christ, growing in Christ, serving Christ, and sharing Christ, you cannot grow if you're not learning, if you're not asking questions, which, by the way, is why small groups, which we call grow groups, Bible studies, Sunday schools, are so very important because they give us opportunities to ask questions, to learn and to grow. If you're not in one, I encourage you to get in one like now, okay? You saw two more are about to pop up this week. These are, this is a great chance. Questions also do something else, though. If you asked one of my two boys, what's the number one easiest way to let somebody know that you care about them. I can tell you right now what their answer is going to be because I've drilled it into them time and time again. The number one easiest way to let somebody know you care about them is to ask them a question. It's cheap. It doesn't cost you anything. And it lets them know that you care about them and what they think and what matters to them and what they know and what they have to offer and how they're feeling. The easiest way to let somebody know you care about them is to ask them, a question, even better, a question about themselves. I got to tell you, I notice every time I'm in conversations with folks and questions never come up, right? Asking and answering questions builds relationships and trust. It shows respect. It increases learning. And best of all, answering really hard questions does more to deepen our own self-awareness than anything else. Why did Jesus ask so many questions? I don't know for sure, he didn't say specifically, but I bet that some of these reasons were at least part of it. And there's one question that Jesus asked that has really been on my mind lately. In fact, I think it's the most important question he ever asked. If someone was going to ask me what's the most important question in all of life, the most important question you could ever be asked or answered, it would be this one. So let's go ahead and take a look together. I encourage you to grab a Bible. There's blue ones in the chair in front of you, or you could pull it up on your phone. We're in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament, but it's still going to be pretty far back, three quarters back in your Bible. We're going to be in Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. All right, here we go. Now, when Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And he said, and what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no human has shown this to you. Brother, it was my father in heaven who has shown it to you. And I will tell you that you are Peter. That means rock, by the way. And I will build my church on this rock. The gates of the underworld won't be able to stand against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. And anything you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. And then he ordered the disciples not to tell anybody that he was the Christ. It wasn't his time yet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The questioner is Jesus. And the question that he's asking you is, who do you say that I am? Who do you say Jesus is? This is the primary question that bridges life on earth with eternal life. All that depends on how you answer this one question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? And I wish it was multiple choice. I wish it was as easy as option one. He was a delusional, charismatic man who tricked people into thinking he was God, basically the leader of a cult. Okay, option two. He was a nice guy who said and did nice things and helped people, but later people falsely embellished his story. 
By the way, this one is harder to pull off academically. In every other area of world history, if we have one credible historical source from ancient times, it gets written in school textbooks as history. We have four historical records about Jesus. They're called the Gospels. It said he was killed on the cross. He was killed on a cross. It says he rose again. He rose again. Okay. Or you have this option, option three, the Son of God, Savior of the world. And I wish it were that simple, but it's not. Because there's this pesky, annoying verse called James 2, 19. And here's what it says. Do you believe that there is only one God? Good. The, deme the demons also believe that and they tremble with fear. Being able to answer option C is not enough, friends. We know the answer is C. We know Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. But there is a deeper question for someone who would call him Lord and Savior. And it is this. Who is Jesus to you? Earlier this summer, I was sitting next to my three-year-old on an airplane, and I got out this um, baby Bible that she's been really into lately. Um, it has a few of the stories in it from the New Testament, and it has like little Velcro pieces that she gets to put in place whenever we get to that part, right? She loves it. I pulled it out because she was bored on the plane. We were reading through it. But there was a man who was sitting next to her on the plane, and he looked over and saw what we were doing. Now, I didn't ask a question. Nothing was verbalized. But questions were hanging in the air, right? Like, uh-oh, what was he going to think about this? Was he going to be giving us a mouthful, an earful? Uh, how was it going to affect what he thought about us? What would his reaction be? What kind of conversation were we going to have? Was he going to launch into a diatribe about how awful Christianity is and how it ruined his life? He knew that the questions, right? This is what goes on in my mind. He knew that the questions, even though they were unspoken, were there. And so after watching us for a minute, he gave his answer to the unasked question. He looked at my daughter Beth and said, I know Jesus. Notice how he answered the fill-in-the-blank question that was in the air. He did not say, I'm a Christian too, or that's a good book. I like to read it. He didn't say, I know about God. He didn't say, I go to church. He said, I know Jesus. It was like we had been uh, talking and discovered that we had a friend in common. Because actually, that's exactly what happened. His answer wasn't about doctrine, about having the right set of beliefs, about agreeing with us or not. He didn't say, I believe in God. He, it wasn't about himself. He didn't say, I'm a Christian. Like, now we belong in the same group together, you know, like the believers group or something. He simply said, I know Jesus. And his Answer revealed a friendship with God, a relationship. Like you talk about Bob from work or Jaden from school. Yeah, sure, I know him. I could recognize his voice. I know what he likes. I know what he thinks about this or that or the other. We laugh together. We talk with each other. I know him. I know Jesus. So I ask you today, who is Jesus to you? Who do you say Jesus is? Peter's answer was the foundation of the body of Christ. Anytime the church walks away, and I mean like the global church, walks away from its commitment to the person of Jesus Christ, they are no longer his body. The reason Peter is the rock of the church isn't because he was the man. It wasn't because there was something superhuman about him. It's because he was the first one to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The foundation of everything spiritual, everything within the church must be Christ as Lord, or it should be put in the trash. To you, is Jesus the one who gets you into heaven? Is Jesus your personal Santa who you talk to when you need something? Is Jesus this like model of good moral behavior? Is Jesus an idea, someone you've learned a lot about? Is he a good teacher in your life? Or is he your life? Is he your love? 
A friend of mine this week was talking about how the source of discipleship, and th- that is a big fancy word for following. The thing we follow, where that comes from, is not just like knowing good things about how to be a Christian. The source of discipleship is what we want. We are a disciple of our desires. And whatever we crave, whatever we will sacrifice for and can't live without, and you can think of a whole list of things that that could be true for, that's truly what we are a disciple of. And I think it is very possible that we spend a lot more time talking about and thinking about God than we do actually encountering God. And God wants to be your savior. Yes, God wants to be your forgiver and your slate cleaner. Yes, God wants to be grace upon grace in your life. Yes, God also wants to be your friend. The one you talk with before your first phone call. The one who can metaphorically walk in, close the door and say, all right, what's really going on with you? The one you laugh with, joke with, cry with. We have to stop relegating Christ to our minds making him, you know, something we measure ourselves up against or an idea we try to live up to, someone we think about. Christ doesn't want to be thought about. He wants a relationship. He wants you to ask how he's feeling and ask you how you're doing. He wants us to say, I don't know what I should do next and hear what he has to say about it. He wants to be the one who can call us on our junk and challenge us to greatness and goodness and contentedness and happiness. A friend? A Hail Mary, a confidant, a last resort, a master, your very breath, as Kat was talking about, a password into heaven. Who in the world is Jesus to you? And I want to invite you to take a minute and think about that. I think my son passed around a little sheet of paper to a lot of y'all when you walked in today. If you didn't get one, all it says is, who is Jesus to you? Take a minute. Try to come up with an answer. It might be a little harder than you would think it would be. That's okay. I encourage you to write it down. Keep it with you. Put it in your Bible. Remind yourself often, who is Jesus to me? If an answer doesn't come easily, that's okay. Take time. Get to an answer. Over the course of my life, I've answered that question in a whole lot of different ways. When I was real young, I would say, yeah, Jesus is the creator and the savior. When I was a little older, I'd say that God was a risk, a gamble. And it might change day by day whether I thought he was a good gamble or a bad one. I thought there was a good chance he might be an illusion. But on June 10, 2000, I chose to be a person of faith. I chose to say that I believed in Jesus Christ to be my God, to have the keys to my life, to dedicate my whole life to him. And I felt more alive than I've ever felt in my entire life, so full of possibility and promise and joy and brokenness and wholeness and healing. And in the ups and downs since then, I've been mad at the Father for feeling far away. And I've had times when I didn't really know what to do with Jesus. And I've learned bit by bit by leap and gallop about the Holy Spirit. And I've learned that the Spirit is never farther than a breath away. And at the very same time, as distant as we choose to make him or her, whatever you call the Spirit. In the hardest moments of my life, I discovered that Jesus' Spirit is my life rope. (laughs) My source of hope. Compassionate and calling me to compassion. Unconditionally loving apart from anything that I accomplish just for who I am and that I am called to love with his love the people who are hard for me to love. Jesus calls me to my best self, the one he intended for me to be from way back in the garden, the one who reminds me who I am and what my dreams really are. And until I reach the next life in heaven, I'm going to be praising and singing and giving and receiving more than I give, and seeking, and finding, and wrestling, and laughing, and believing, and devoting, and praising, and singing again, and again, and again, until I can say that Christ is my whole life, and my whole life is in him, that Christ is my love, and all my love is his love, until I hear him say, well done, 
good and faithful servant. I think it is very possible that this language is uncomfortable. That when I say things like, you are a disciple of what you crave, and do you crave God, that that feels awkward. <laughs> and for you to think that that's not language you're comfortable with. If that's you, okay, that's fine. I hope you're curious about why that is. I hope you ask questions about what that means. What would it mean for me to crave Christ in the ways that I think? Crave Christ in my marriage or in my family. Crave Christ in my heart. Crave Christ's leadership for my future, for my finances, for my ministry, for my call. Friends, I have to admit I'm kind of tired. We're all tired. The world is tired in particular, of Christians who say they are Christians. Do not tell me. Do not tell people that you're a Christian. Tell me you know Jesus. Let me see it in the way that you live and the way that you treat people that other people cast aside. Let me see how he is the Christ of your life. Tell me what he told you or something funny he did recently. If you know him, that's going to happen. The devil and his angels know that Jesus is Lord and shudder. Knowing about Christ is not enough, friends. It's not. And it's not that it's not enough from you. It's not good enough for you. You deserve the whole life, the whole peace that surpasses understanding, the whole joy, and Christ deserves you. Who is Jesus to you? Let's pray about that right now, okay? Jesus, we thank you for what you taught us. I mean, this passage means so many different things, but one of the things we noticed today is that you ask us really good questions and that you deserve to be answered. Help us to come to a place where we can answer the question, who is Jesus to me? And God, I think it's possible that, that there are folks who know about God, but maybe they've never actually encountered you or experienced you in their very lives. If that's true, Lord, I want to take an opportunity to say, God, we want you to be our God. We ask for your forgiveness of our sin. We need you in our lives. We need you to save us from the mess that we make. We cannot do life on our own. We want you to be our master and our savior. We put all of our trust in you for this life and the next. Please take control of my life. Please be the one who leads and guides me. Please be my friend. And for those of us who maybe have known Jesus for a while, help us to say it. Help us to talk like we have a relationship with you and that you're more than an idea. And help us to have that experience over and over again of you being personal and relevant and specific in our lives. Help us, forgive us for those times where we just think about you and talk about you, but we don't actually engage with you. And thank you for making that even a possibility. Thank you for loving us enough that you even want it. And help us to be people who shift ourselves from this like more safe thinking about you kind of thing to you being our very life and breath. We want to be Christ in the world like you call us to be. Help us to be in Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I, I think we need a louder amen than that. <laughs> As an amen. Thank you, Lindsay. At this time, we get to stand up together and to lift our voices in song once again. Um, so if you're in the sanctuary and you're willing and able to stand with us, please do so at this time. If you're at home once again, the words will be on the screen. We encourage you to sing along with us. Um, let's join together again.
thank you. And thanks for being in worship with us today. We hope we get to worship together again next Sunday. Speaking of next Sunday, we're having a big back-to-school bash. Bring all the students in your life, kids, grandkids, who, neighbors, friends, whoever. And we're going to be blessing each of these kids as they start a new school year. Um, and y'all know, like, that's a really good way to start this year. Um, and also, it's going to be a homecoming Sunday. So I'm going to issue each one of you a challenge. I want you to pray about and come to invite at least one friend to come to church next week, okay? And I'm going to be looking for all the new faces in the congregation next week. One friend to help people kind of kickstart back into their spiritual walk after all the craziness we've been through together in the last 18 months or so. Thank you for being here. I look for you next Sunday. And as we go from this place, remember God goes before you to show you the way, behind you to keep you moving, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you always to give you peace. Amen.